exploding a massive building straight down into its own foundation is a technique that's been developed over the last 100 years through trial and error. And the methods are still evolving. Every blast site is a classroom, every structure a textbook, and every detonation is a potentially lethal lesson in the relationship between steel, concrete, gravity, and high explosives. In the early days, the men who blew up buildings were powerful renegades. Today, the men and women who handle these violent projects are meticulous professionals, known as much for subtlety as for destruction. Introducing the Blasters. Five, four, three, two, one. At every blast on Earth, reputations are on the line. The column right here. In Charlotte, North Carolina, blaster Steve Pettigrew grapples with the task of bringing down this sprawling 600,000 square foot convention center surrounded on all sides by fragile buildings. The good news is it's not real tall. So if it was 10 or 12 stories, it would be a little more difficult. It's one of the largest demolition jobs planned on the planet this year. Right down the middle, so we're cutting the building in two. Just going direct here. And I'll but more than just the building is at stake. You're still a thousand back there, right? I'm at 800 milliseconds here. You're still at a thousand back there, right? If Steve fails to safely flatten the center with just one push of a button, it will be his second problem project in a row, an unacceptable track record for any blaster. To probably truly punch through a 30. In Hamilton, Ohio. This father and son blast team are preparing to take out this old bridge foundation, which sits just one meter away from the fully operating new bridge. To do it, they're relying on dynamite and a group of rookie laborers who have never handled explosives before. This is how we detonate this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and in Dublin, Ireland, Great Britain's only female blast engineer needs to get 4,000 perfectly placed holes drilled into this 17-story building. But a labor dispute has Holly Bennett's entire team unable to work. Well, we were the plane drivers here. And uh, we were promised wages and uh, they broke our contract. These explosive innovators experience dizzying amounts of life and death stress during every job. Everybody can come out of the exclusion zone, nobody can go in. Tension makes them tick. In fact, blasters are the only people on Earth who never really relax until the sky is falling. Steve Pettigrew is respected as one of the best blasters in the world. He holds the world's record for the longest blast ever performed, a 62-second series of explosions that brought down Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. But his specialty is giving sports and entertainment venues their final wave. Today, he's sizing up his newest job, the Charlotte Convention Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's only six stories tall, but it covers 600,000 square feet, an entire city block, making it one of the largest buildings in the world scheduled for explosive demolition this year. About 100,000 square feet is parking area, and the rest of it is uh, floor space, and also was a, a kitchen in, in the lower levels. What makes this blast especially difficult is not how large the convention center is, but where it's actually situated. We're, we're exposed on all four sides. Every side has a liability. The liabilities include several glass-fronted hotels and towers, plus Charlotte's main bus terminal. This multi-purpose building contains diverse architectural challenges for Steve as a blaster. To bring this building to its knees, Steve has spent 12 weeks planning out the details. How close are you to wrap it up? Ooh, probably about another hour. This blast is especially nerve-wracking for Steve Pettigrew because if the Charlotte Convention Center doesn't fall, 
His name is one of the planet's most trusted blasters, Will. Steve's last project, a mothballed nuclear power plant located in the wilds of Indiana, was a humbling experience. That was an industrial site and it was wide open and there we tried to keep it simple. We basically had two positions that we were shooting. Steve knew this structure was earthquake proof and it's not located near any other buildings that could be damaged by flying debris. So, to be certain it came down, he loaded it with extra powerful shape charges. The explosives used to cut steel support beams. I had enough charges there was 20 to 30 percent over the manufacturer's penetration levels. Because the charge's actual cutting power was less than expected, the beams weren't fully severed and the building didn't come down. I guess it was earthquake proof. It's what blasters politely call a hang-up. Hang-ups are very rare. It's always a little embarrassing and hard to talk about. When you have a failure, failure meaning that your charges don't penetrate or work as they're supposed to, uh, it's just a matter of going back and, and reshooting it. Could that same thing happen in North Carolina? If it happened here, we'd have, gather with the local police building department, have a contingency plan, but it, it won't happen here. <laughs> One hang up is grim, but two in a row would be a nightmare. Who's going to hire a blaster that can't bring down a building? All right, here we go. While Steve grapples with his task, two generations of Gustafson men are now in Hamilton, Ohio, continuing a family tradition. I mean, how many, how many other people get to, you know, I mean, basically have Baghdad in the middle of a town and get away with it and not hurt anything, <laughs> you know, I mean. When it comes to blasting bridges, the Gustafson family of Dubois, Wyoming, is North America's premier team. Right now, Scott and son Cody are in Hamilton, Ohio. She's bleeding on us. Claire. Their mission is to completely demolish the massive concrete arches and piers of this old bridge without damaging the new bridge beside it. And perhaps more importantly, they can't harm the historic Civil War Memorial that overlooks the Great Miami River. Not far from this site in 1863, Confederate soldiers crossed into Ohio on a deadly thousand mile raid that would see almost 600 casualties. The Gustafsons guarantee when they set off their dynamite five days from now, no blood will be shed into the river, just thousands of tons of steel and concrete. The bridge has already had the top deck removed. What remains is one massive concrete block resting on five columns. To break that structure into pieces that can be easily extracted from the river, the Gustafson blast team is boring 1,200 holes. Each one will be stuffed with dynamite. Five arches done. Um, gonna go put the mini back up on the trailer and we're done with it. Got oh, about 40 more holes to do with the big drill and we'll be ready to load tomorrow morning. Imagine the bridge as a tooth and the muddy riverbank as its gums. Underground, the bridge has a long root that also needs to be exploded and pulled out. There's no anesthetic for this job, just a four meter long drill that's chewing through replacement bits. Yeah, that's why it sounds different. Broke that steel. Wow. They're not designed for drilling steel, so we abuse a lot of them. We're always, because we're in the demolition game, so we're drilling rebar and pipes and anything else they buried in there that they can think of. You don't know what it is until after you get it all apart. We're done for the day. We quit. <laughs> We're out of here. <laughs> Go back, get a shower, get a bite to eat, and get horizontal. <laughs> get some sleep. We're going to need it. Be busy. I mean, 1,200 holes after a while. Boy, I'll tell you, it takes its toll on your back. Yeah. I was going to grab those other tampon poles, or did you send them over? Or no, I thought, I thought Blasters are also teachers. They can't take a full team of workers with them wherever they go, so day laborers are always on site. 
On this job, most of the men handling the explosives have never touched dynamite before. 23-year-old Cody explains the dangers. The most big concern we have is the dynamite and the caps. You can't hurt the dynamite. The caps are a different story. Don't throw them around. You know, we'll just toss them on the ground, put them by each hole, but don't try to bend them, run over them. Right there, Dad has a, uh, it's cord. It's called non-L. It's non-electric. This is how we detonate this stuff. It's the only explosive that you can hang on to and get away with it. <laughs> Three, two, one. Roll it. <laughs> uh, I didn't bite you before, but that's how it goes. 16 will lead that out there. Drop this down into the pier, in the, in the gully. Just, just, don't, just don't put it in the mud. Yeah. Okay. You guys keep try to keep your gloves on. Then let's glisten in the uh, dynamite when you're grabbing it. Don't rub your eyes. Keep it away from your face. And that stuff will just give you one hell of a headache. <laughs> A steel spike, called a powder punch, is used to create a hole in each stick of dynamite. Hey, boys, make it out. All right. Making those holes nice and round, are you? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> a blasting cap with a precise timer is inserted into the hole. The dynamite is then stuffed into the bridge and tapped into place. Dad, have these all been punched? Pushed down? Scott's plan is not to explode the bridge all at once. He wants the 1,200 individual explosions to flow across the river from left to right over the course of two and a half seconds. This will lessen the amount of vibrations caused by the blast. And that's important because a single explosion using this much firepower would be strong enough to cause serious damage to the nearby war memorial. Where are we at? 1,221? <laughs> Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. To keep rainwater or other moisture from entering the loaded blast holes, each hole is sealed with an inverted cone. Those cones then get covered and filled with gravel to weigh them down. Excellent. Good deal. When one of the arches on the bridge is fully prepared, bundles of chain link fencing are rolled out. Then geotech fabric is anchored to the fence. Without this protective covering, the blast would spray pieces of concrete in every direction. You know, see, the biggest thing is if this thing takes off or whatever, and we throw a lot of gravel up in the air or something like that, and you got any kind of wind drift or something like that, you know, I mean, if it's slack like this, it just kind of goes up and comes down. But, I mean, you know, that's why we safety everybody back. You know, we're not expecting it, but, you know, it, it's still the blasting game. So, you know, you want to be real careful with it. The blasting world is very small. The world of people who cover blasts for insurance purposes is even smaller. Mr. Gustafson. Migrated. Holy Good afternoon, sir. Brent Blanchard works alongside the elite blasters of the world, documenting 200 demolitions per year. He's here today, fresh from a job in Amman, Jordan. So, so did you bring me back any kind of, you know, you know, marinated camel uh, stew uh, or anything? I brought you delicacies galore. I'll bet you. <laughs> okay. How, uh, what do you have going on here as far as, uh, you know, liabilities? There's some obvious ones, I guess. Oh, that's your problem. Okay. <laughs> uh, you're going to pull inspection on this uh, memorial building here, this war museum here. This this is a real priority for the town. It's it's something that they, they treasure pretty heavily. Hey, Kevin. Just want to keep an eye on those boys out there. Over the years, Brent has learned how to talk his way into almost any restricted area. I well, wanted to see, first of all, I guess, if you had any access to the roof that we could just take a few photos or maybe document the conditions up there closer to the statue or the roof line. Uh, I can get you up here, but it's not very safe. Well, after riding that camel last week, this ought to be easy, right? <laughs> Dangers are middle name. Okay. <laughs> so this is... Uh, these are, we're going to protect all of this. All yeah, this is, here. we're going to hang the blankets outside here. Okay. To protect the Civil War Memorial's stained glass window from any possible flying debris, the Gustafsons hoist a large piece of geotech fabric. 
Brent goes up to inspect the condition of the roof and scout for camera angles. But he won't be the one filming this job. He's left the job of documenting this blast to his right-hand man, Jeff. Brent's off to North Carolina to document Steve Pettigrew's huge convention center demolition. It's the day before the blast, and the Gustafsons are ahead of schedule, but still working hard. We've got maybe an hour here just to finish loading this pier, and uh, we'll tie it in, and then we're pretty much done for the day until our security guard comes. Hot. Fifty years ago, Scott's father was a pioneer in the blasting here. business. Here, Dad. Today, his son Cody is on the cutting edge. Here's a cup for you. Huh? <laughs> yeah. With all the day laborers at home, the true professionals can finally relax a little. Is it the red one goes to the blue one, or the blue one goes, but well, we don't have a blue one. Wait a minute, which one do we cut first, <laughs> the red or the yellow? Yellow ground or red ground? <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm getting tangled up here. Jeff also installs several seismographs right next to the Civil War Memorial Building. These devices are inserted into the ground to measure and record the amount of vibrations caused by the blast. These measurements are a critical component to every explosive demolition project as they represent the only scientific record of the blast's effects. The Gustafsons install the final piece of bridge covering. Now there's nothing to do but wait. Don't look any better than that. Good. We're done. Good job, Jack. With time to kill, Cody has a chance to soak up some rays and hit the country's most exclusive driving range. Play some golf. Is that little driving contest to leave a little stress? Everything's fun and games right now, but tomorrow morning when the countdown begins, the Gustafsons will be all business. So, okay, y'all. Officers, heads up. Basically what's going to do here... It's the morning of the blast. As a wake-up call, Scott takes command of the police team that will be responsible for securing the perimeter of the blast zone. You're going to go to your pre-assigned locations there. Do a little bit of radio checks to make sure everybody's on location and it's looking good. Any questions? Let's keep it safe. That's it. <laughs> if I could have you guys just go down to the viewing area, if you don't mind. Do you cork down there? Yep, just right the uh, south side of the apartment. Okay. If you don't mind. Okay, no I appreciate it, guys. Okay. Thank you very much. How are you making out, Cody? Yeah, we're doing good. Cody goes onto the bridge to make a final check of all the connections. The exclusion zone around the blast site is supposed to be locked down. Yeah, we got a guy in a wheelchair back over here. <laughs> Someone pushing him out of here. He's got a of people keep an eye But stragglers who aren't aware of what's going on continue to appear, frustrating the Gustafsons. And Mike, uh, how did he get through? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Let's go back and get this one going. <clears throat> okay, everybody heads up there, and uh, we're just coordinating with the police. Okay. How's everybody doing on your end? Fine. Everything okay on that side of the bank? We're coming up on the one minute warning. One minute warning. Roger, time director to personnel, all clear. Police all clear? Police all clear. 
As a favor to the man who hired them for this blast, the Gustafsons are letting his son push the detonation button. The starter will become engaged when he squeezes the button, and the blast will occur when he releases the button. Okay. Hold that button down. Do not let it up. You can hold it down right now. Do not let it up there. You got it down? Going for the 10 countdown. Here's 10. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hit it. Let's go check it out. You guys just hold your position until we give you an all clear siren. Congratulations will have to wait until after the final inspection. So far, the Gustafsons like what they see. Let's do a quick safety yep. check over on the bridge here. Just let the smoke clear out just for half a second here. It's going to go around this corner here. It's going to hang with us a little bit, buddy. but it is drifting down ring. Good job. Yeah, don't go away. I want to congratulate you. The bridge's entire concrete foundation was systematically obliterated, and vibrations from the blast Looking were great. well within acceptable levels. Best adrenaline rush you can get. I mean, you get the noise. <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, how many how many other people get to you know? I mean, basically, have Baghdad in the middle of a town and get away with it and not hurt anything. <laughs> you know, I mean. Now, the Civil War Memorial can rest assured that in the next hundred years, it should never witness another act of destruction quite as aggressive as this one. The blast is a total success. For Scott Gustafson, there was never any doubt. Great way to start a Sunday morning, isn't it? <laughs> Love it. Back in North Carolina, Steve Pettigrew is experiencing plenty of doubt. He is preparing to demolish this enormous building by using an array of heavy explosives. It's one of the biggest blast projects planned anywhere on Earth this year. With more than 40 people working under him, a big part of Steve's job is communication. And already, he's at a disadvantage. The newest members of his crew don't speak English. Yesterday, I tried to look around the site just to troubleshoot but today I'm dedicated strictly to, to wiring. To start that wiring, Steve needs more than 2,000 specifically placed holes drilled into the building. The job of making sure the Spanish-speaking laborers understand exactly how and where to drill those holes falls upon Steve's colleague, Bo Hinton. We want to interpret it one. Okay, first thing we want to talk about this morning is... The drilling plan gets explained then implemented. While the holes get drilled, a core member of Steve's team uses an acetylene torch to cut through a skywalk connecting the convention center to a neighboring hotel. If the explosion happens perfectly, the skywalk, seen right here, should remain suspended and unscathed. The explosion in a blast of this size is really several thousand small explosions, all happening over the course of several seconds. Two different types of explosive charges are being used to bring down the Charlotte Convention Center. The kind being prepared to go into the freshly drilled columns and walls is good old-fashioned dynamite. Shape charges are the second type of explosive being used. They're made of copper tubing and packed with a combustible compound called RDX. And when they go off, they don't obliterate a beam so much as they slice through the beam. A jet of like fire comes right out of here and that's what actually cuts the steel. To make sure the beams are weak enough to be defeated by the charge, they've all been partially cut. To chop this massive beam into sections, Four huge shape charges are being set here on the interior of the building. 
The entire process of drilling and loading dynamite and fastening shape charges takes Steve a total of six working days. Once it's all done, every single one of the charges is wired to the same main detonating line. This red plastic tube is the main artery for the blast. When the button is pushed, a thin wave of fire rushes through the tube at a speed of five miles per second, more than 20 times faster than the speed of sound. The shock wave triggers all the blasting caps at practically the same instant. However, each individual cap then waits until it's their predetermined time to go off. Watch again. At the Gustafson's blast in Ohio, the caps went off first. Then, starting from the far end of the bridge, the real explosions marched down the line. and everything to pull in and all I want to do is bring it out five degrees. The explosions in this blast have been designed to continue for nine seconds. If they all work, Steve will collect his cash and go home. But if they fail and the building remains standing, Steve will have to pay whatever it costs to bring the remnants down. Obviously, when a building is being imploded, as it's called, there is potential danger for people and property. Not surprisingly, Owners of neighboring buildings sometimes claim that their building was damaged by flying debris or excessive vibrations. Enter Brent Blanchard. Hey, Brent. How you doing? Did you get a hold of David? Good afternoon. I'm not yet. Just got on site. Okay. The same man who documented the Gustafson's blast in Ohio is now here in North Carolina to look after Steve. Brent's job is to document not only the blast, but all the buildings around the blast site. This being a hotel, a four-star hotel this close, uh, to have something go wrong here would be pretty substantial. We're going to photograph it. We're going to show uh, all these little areas, like, uh, you know, where you see some of the molding or the trim is coming away from the concrete. Chances are these folks really don't know that this condition exists. So that's one of the reasons we take thousands of photographs out here, is to make sure there's an independent record of just what existed, plain and simple. Brent and his team have been working with blasters for over two decades now. In the beginning, his video coverage of each explosion was pretty rudimentary. He'd set up one or two cameras and that'd be it. But as Brent developed into the world's busiest blast photographer, his creativity also grew. Now he uses multiple cameras to shoot the implosions from the most amazing angles imaginable. Brent has been working with blasters for so long, he's learned most of their trade secrets. Steve explains the plan. He wants Brent to get the best footage possible because when the dust settles, Steve will scrutinize the blast tapes, the same way a boxer watches film of his last fight. It's the only way to truly know what went right or what went wrong. Last, some of Brent's cameras get intentionally destroyed, so there is no tape in the expendable camera. Instead, a cable runs all the way to a video recorder. The key to success is positioning the camera and cables in a way that keeps them from getting crushed for as long as possible. When that cable is severed, it's game over. To understand how the convention center will be demolished, watch this high-rise blast. This building is taller, but the principle is identical. The blast obliterates the middle of the structure first, effectively cutting it in half. Next, delayed charges cause the two sides to fall towards each other. To understand how the convention center will be sliced into massive sections, simply follow the red main fuse, or the trunk line as it's known, as it crisscrosses the structure. That trunk line extends a diagonal echelon pattern from one side of the building to the other. The trunk line crisscrosses the building like this on all floors. When the button gets pushed, the basement columns and ground floor walls will be obliterated first, making the building hover momentarily. As it starts to fall, another series of explosions will cut the building into manageable sections. 
Then the remaining load-bearing walls will collapse in rapid succession. As the roof drops straight down, the final explosions will further tear it to pieces. If it all goes according to plan, Steve will push the button in 36 hours. But as Steve well knows, in the blasting game, plans can shatter. In Dublin, Ireland, Great Britain's only female blasting engineer is in command of 40 men, and they're starting to get testy. We're here to get our wages. We're all there, but back money and wages, and we haven't been paid yet. If she doesn't get them back to work, her career could be the only thing that gets destroyed here. Holly Bennett, Britain's only female blast engineer, is here in Dublin, Ireland, preparing to take down this derelict building, the 17-story tall McDonough apartment tower. I don't really think about being the only woman. It's more about what type of person you are if you can do the job. I don't think it's a, a male-female thing at all. Holly didn't design this blast plan, but she has set it in motion. That means she's ordered all the explosives, hired all the workers who have weakened all the walls, removed the asbestos, and drilled over 4,000 holes. It's been really quite difficult, to be honest with you. The lads have been working non-stop. And it's just been tough in every respect, really. It's not easy to organize an explosives demolition in four weeks. Blasters have to be leaders on the job site. Are you debting them as well? Or do you want me to come up? Holly's in charge of 40 people, and if they're not working, she's not happy. Today, the crane operators are boldly staging an impromptu strike that could cost Holly hundreds of hours worth of lost labor. We're here to get our wages. We're all there, but back money and wages, and we haven't been paid yet. Holly pulls some strings, and in less than 90 minutes, the crisis is averted, and the entire job site bustles again. Good thing, too. Her senior colleagues are here, fresh from their successful blast in Jordan. Without these men, this blast can't happen. There's just too much work for one person to safely handle. And then we should have 240, 4.8 equals. Yeah. Holly's been working with controlled demolition for nine years, but her start at the company wasn't very glamorous. At Controlled, I was the office junior, believe it or not. I worked in the office making tea, that kind of thing, and then made an off-the-cuff remark about wanting to be an explosives engineer. The more people that laughed at me because I'd said it, the more determined I was to do it. Every blast has its complications. For this one, it's the proximity of its neighbour, the Axis Convention Centre. It is incredibly close to the Axis Centre. Um, it's only eight metres away. The McDonough apartment building is constructed from large panels. The panels can break away during collapse and come to rest on the outer edge of the debris pile. When that happens, the growing pile of rubble can turn into a mountain of a problem. Sliding panels could crash into the glass-fronted convention center. We've had to put protection in place in the form of um, steel containers with rubble inside to ballast them. As the saying goes, good fences make good neighbors. To make the apartment building collapse safely, the 4,000 individual charges that Holly's team is now loading into the building have to go off at precise intervals. The apartment building is almost like two separate structures that share a common wall. The plan is to demolish the supporting walls and columns on the lower levels of this side first. When it begins to drop, the other half of the building should lean ever so slightly in to fill the void. Then, less than one second after the first round of explosions, the charges sealed into the foundation of this side will go off. Hopefully, the entire building will then begin falling away from the convention center. 20 years ago, blasters used copper wiring that was initiated by an electrical charge. Hello. Cell phones put an end to that technology. Static electricity created by these devices can accidentally trigger an electrical system. Well, the entire system that we use is non-electric. These tubes that you see here are literally plastic tubes. Using a totally non-electric system like this is really the only way you can do things these days. It's just 18 hours until the blast is scheduled to happen. I think it's done. There's only three holes on the stairwell to do. As some crew members secure a skin of protective geotech fabric around the floors, other crew members put finishing touches on the defensive shield, packing hay bales in between the shipping containers and the convention center. 
And if these containers move, this will arrest it and stop damage to these columns. But we don't foresee the containers moving. It's just an extra precaution. Inside, Mick deals with the last bits of wiring. He's tired, but happy that Holly has this building ready to blast right on schedule. So you've got this total block ready in four weeks, which is usually about a nine or ten week job. So they've got it pretty rough, but uh, they've done a cracking job. With the building finally packed with explosives, Mick begins cordoning off the exclusion zone. Just push it out a little bit. Every worker on site has been ordered to leave the zone. The ones required for the blast will come back at 6 a.m. Yeah. Nobody's going back in today either. No. In the morning, the first person who tries to get into the exclusion zone isn't a blaster. It's a blasted partier trying to find his way home so he can wash last night out of his hair. Mick and Holly arrive on site and immediately get to work. First order of business is to establish the full exclusion zone. We need barriers leaving here to shut this road. Traffic was allowed through overnight, but now no civilian can come close to the doomed apartment building. No, no, no. Holly leads security workers to the area they'll be guarding. The footpath stays open anyway, but the road obviously is closed. So if you just stay here for now, right, I'll give you a shout over the radio when it's time. All right. Meanwhile, her colleagues, Phil and Dick, go inside the building to make sure nothing happened to the connections overnight. Outside, Mick is being told by his security that the Dublin police are not letting them keep the exclusion zone barricades up. With traffic rushing past, Mick goes into crisis management mode. These roads close from 8 o'clock. I'm going to get these road close signs up now so nobody comes in. But they must not allow any traffic in that way. Mick has been blasting for 25 years, and he knows that it's possible for debris to be expelled far from a blasted building. If the exclusion zone doesn't extend to the point originally planned, Mick will refuse to go ahead with the blast. Well, that's been drawn up for, like, two months or... He's not changing it now. Satisfied that the police are finally living up to their agreement, Mick enters the building to connect the main trunk line. The blast is on. Everything's in. Not missed anything. So, all ready to go. But when he comes out, the blast is off. Mick abandons the line and heads to the other side of the building to deal with a breach of security. What they're after down there is they jump the barrier. By the time he finds out what's going on, it's all over. Yeah, the two people have been uh, arrested. Mick returns to help Phil deal with the main trunk line. Road's clear anyway, isn't it? Now? Oh, yeah, 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 no problem. The exclusion zone is finally secure. The crowd is anxious, and the button is hooked up and ready to push. But unbelievably, security is breached again. Someone has been spotted inside the convention center, and you guessed it, the blast is delayed. Uh, Holly, have you checked with the security that's up there? Uh, Holly and Mick check for themselves. With the crowd and crew waiting, the convention center is methodically searched. Why do they bother having coordination meetings? When no one turns up, the blast is back on. Are we starting again? Yes. Go for off blast. And Mick is eager to push the button before any other holdups can occur. However, when Big Dave goes to fire off the warning flare, he can't get it lit. He can't even get his cigarette lit. How else can go wrong? Only one other thing can go wrong, the blast itself. But the blast is the only thing Mick has any real faith in. When it's finally safe, he has Holly count him down. As the crowd roars its approval, Big Dave heads toward the convention center to assess the results. Fantastic job, absolutely fantastic. I mean, these guys have done miracles here, and to get this down in four weeks is unbelievable. We've cracked one window, unfortunately. I ain't the end of the world. Definitely on this job. God, it's anything better than that. 
Walking away, one of the most experienced teams of apartment building blasters on the planet is satisfied to know that another high-rise has bitten the dust. Back in Charlotte, North Carolina, Steve Pettigrew wishes he could smell the dusty wreckage of this massive convention center. Tomorrow morning, he'll get his chance. It's 5 a.m. in Charlotte, North Carolina. In four and a half hours, one of the largest blasts to be held anywhere on Earth this year is going to go down. Okay, good morning, gentlemen. Everybody knows what we're doing. Today's the day. To be on site today, every worker must sign in to the exclusion zone. Hey, this morning, everybody sign in. 6.15, they'll block the street. I'll put the trailers out there, and then we'll get this fence pulled back across here. Before the blast can happen, every worker must sign out of the zone. This last minute work is all about safety. Crews fill any gaps in the protective barrier that encompasses the blast site. But take up that slack. Steve's been up There's for no hours. No sense in losing 50 feet of line. He's overseeing the installation of the final bit of detonating line and the dumping of gravel around the base of the building. This weight will hold down the geotech fabric, ensuring it doesn't flap loose when the air inside gets pushed out by the force of the blast. Steve and a handful of his colleagues enter the building to do their final check. When they exit, they will be the last people to ever set foot in this old hall of memories. Morning. Morning. How's, How's it going? Good. Good. When Steve emerges, Brent is waiting and hoping that everything's on schedule. It is, which means Brent's team has two hours to set up seven seismographs and five video cameras. His two sacrificial demo cams were set yesterday, one in the basement and the other on the roof. A trusted crew member guards the yellow detonation cord that is ultimately connected to every explosive device inside the building. It's boring, but extremely important. Brent is in a race against the clock. He chose his camera angles days ago, but now, in part due to an unexpected rainstorm, everything's changing. As Brent positions himself on a deck across the street from the blast site, he sees a work crew coming towards him with a roll of protective sheeting. I have no idea right now where this curtain is going to be raised. It's kind of a judgment call. It's supposed to be raised right here, but if they move it even a little from where it's supposed to be, it'll obstruct this whole view. Can I sneak down and back up again real quick? All right, thanks. Brent needs to talk to the men setting up the protective curtain, but first, he needs to find them. To do that, he needs to find his way out. We come through these double doors? We went this way. You gotta be kidding me. Brent better hurry. The detonating line is being connected, and the blast is just 25 minutes away. How high up are these going? Brent learns the geotech fabric will hang in a way that blocks the right side of his shot. While Steve paces, worrying and wondering if this blast will be a success or his second hang-up in a row, Brent runs to his car and prepares to do more running. I don't have faith that... Everyone we've briefed on what we're going to be doing is going to be in the right spot and going to allow us to do it, especially the police and the people we don't have control over. So that means I'm going to switch into running attire and we're not going to plan on using the vehicle anymore. We're actually going to run to two opposite sides of the site. Brent hoofs it to his video command center, a protected nook tucked underneath a bridge. Here is where the images from his two sacrificial cameras will be recorded. A cable runs from these recorders all the way to the cameras in the basement and on the roof. While Brent runs to trigger more cameras, Steve is wrestling with a certain kind of anxiety known only to blasters. I think we got a concrete column right here. Remember, Steve's last implosion didn't quite work properly. Yes, it was an earthquake proof. He can see an unwired column. If it's solid concrete, the blast will have to be postponed. If it's only made of block, it should tumble in the explosion. That's, that's block. That's block behind. I don't know what block corner. It is? Oh, yes. Okay.
I think it's just blocked. I thought it was a concrete column on the corner there. But I think it's just, nah, it's just blocked. With eight minutes left, Brett heads to his final camera location. When he emerges onto the roof, he discovers that another member of his team, Lisa, is already one step ahead of him. So how are you making out? Good, I'm all set up. I moved it closer because I think it's a better angle with the, with the building. Okay. I didn't need to run up here? Pretty much, yeah. Presidente had it covered? Okay. <laughs> on the ground, everything's progressing on schedule, so the detonating line gets extended to the edge of the exclusion zone. All right, bring him out, Bob. All throughout the area, the workers sign out. Come on, boys, let's go, let's go, let's do this. But they don't go far. Everyone wants to see the blast. However, some people want to watch a little too closely. Hey, just, just so you know, you have a guy right on the front corner of that parking garage that's just to the north. Four construction guys from, look like they're from the uh, Coliseum. Okay. They were up on the top deck of that parking garage. Apparently, the exclusion zone isn't very exclusive. I mean, geez, Louise, I mean, that's only like, what, 100 feet away? Steve is not impressed, and neither are the police. This blast is postponed indefinitely. In Charlotte, North Carolina, Steve Pettigrew is waiting, and he's not a man who likes to wait. Well, we're waiting for the Charlotte police to get back. Two minutes, uh... Especially when he has an entire city block wired with explosives. The exclusion zone around this blast site was seriously breached six minutes before the detonation was due to occur. Now the police are finishing their sweep, and Steve is preparing to fire. Nobody in there. As the detonation button gets attached to the fuse line, the police confirm the exclusion zone is now vacant. As the wire watcher teaches the building owner's son how to push the button, Steve sounds the two-minute warning. All right, two-minute warning. It's nerve-wracking. In the last decade, two people have been killed watching blasts. One in Canberra, Australia, and one in Glasgow, Scotland. Then, to Steve's disbelief, another man appears out of nowhere, well past the police line. This time, the police move quickly to re-establish their security perimeter. For Steve, the site is now secure enough to proceed without doing another complete sweep. I'm not college. College is great. Stay away from that corner there. There are wires that come across the road. With the coast hopefully clear, Steve enters the final phase. OK, warm up the machine. The machine has the button which triggers the detonation. OK, here we go. 10, 9, 8. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, fire. looked perfect from from the very first yeah. look from what we've seen that looked perfect the debris so tiny they're gonna have that cleaned up in five minutes the blast goes exactly as Steve planned starting in the middle of the building the charges work their way to the perimeter on the northern side a huge wedge shape is blown away allowing the convention center to fall in on itself on the southern side, the precious hotel walkway remains intact. On the eastern side, look at how well the shape charges sliced perfectly through this main beam. All Brent's running around paid off handsomely. He got incredible footage from inside the building, and the camera on the roof surfed the crest of the explosion for five seconds before the inevitable occurred. The aftermath seems almost apocalyptic, but it's a good news story. The blast has successfully brought the convention center down to the ground. Steve calls Jeff, his main project manager, to confirm the success. Jeff, yeah, looks good. Walkway's still standing, you know. Yeah. I think we got three, four broken windows so far. Uh, yeah. All right. 
All right, thanks. What? Overall, you got to take what you got. It was good. It was I real good. It so was you're happy. Happy, yeah. It's a real good shot. Steve has done it. By bringing down the Charlotte Convention Center, his reputation as one of the greatest blasters in the world remains standing. In the world of blasting, there are no award shows, no trophies, no big parties to honor the men and women who create these jaw-dropping spectacles. Blasters live isolated lives, often away from home, focused on one thing and one thing only perfect destruction. That's the prize. When the countdown is on, don't get behind a wall. Get behind the blasters.